Boarding schools are amongst the most influential institutions in Britain, responsible for educating many of our politicians, judges and business leaders, even three quarters of our prime ministers. An estimated million people in the country boarded as children, but it's only now, decades on, that the true extent of sexual abuse in these schools is coming to light. I could smell the abuse because abuse has a smell that is a particular smell that you will only know if you've been abused. At eight years old, I was assaulted by a paedophile teacher myself. My name is Alex Renton. I'm an investigative journalist and I'm trying to find out how much the schools knew about what was going on behind their doors. Hi there. I was very keen to talk to you about, about this character Pilgrim. I've had people say to me, oh, come on, a little bit of fumbling around. You can't blame your problems on that. Well, that's poisonous claptrap. It's like having a, a toxin inside you, isn't it? I meet survivors speaking openly for the first time and ask what went wrong in so many of these institutions. There would have been a scandal, but it seems that being a duty care, the responsible person at that school was him. Were schools really willing to disregard children's safety to protect reputations? And how did they get away with it? I could turn the clock back. I would never send him away. And most importantly, I want to know, are children in boarding schools today safe? In terms of the grooming, the school was complicit. I went away to board at the age of nine. The school was always talked about. I cried all night that first night, but the abuse I received... As a child, I did think about running away from boarding school, but then I realised... I want to cry, but Mummy said, you'll love it here. It's what one does. Boarding school, how for centuries Britain has educated its elite. And in 1969, I was sent off to join their ranks. Ashton House, a famous boys' prep school in Sussex, was expected to be the making of me. My parents weren't to know, would never have imagined, that in a matter of months, I would be sexually abused by my teacher. More than 40 years have passed, but I still remember the excitement of my first day at Ashton House, aged eight. In reality, I think it was the end of my childhood. The first night was terrible. I can remember being terrified in a very cold bed, trying not to cry. You lived permanently under the threat of violence. So you could be beaten for almost anything, for talking after lights out. You could be beaten for not doing very well in your Latin prep. There's a permanent low-level state of fear. It was a brutal regime under my headmaster, Billy Williamson. You had to learn to live with it, our new life. But then there was the sexual abuse. Mr. Keane was my maths and history teacher in that first year. My memory of my sexual encounter with him is only once, and it was in the classroom where he, he usually taught. And I remember very clearly the physical feeling of being pressed up against his sort of hairy tweed jacket while he had an arm around me and his other hand was going straight down the front of my corduroy shorts. And, and I remember quite distinctly being given the, the fruit gum afterwards, which I knew already was what you got if you submitted to this. But he was a very violent man, so I'm not sure what submission meant. I don't think you could have said no. Sorry. OK, let's compose myself. These schools instilled in us a rule of silence, which has kept many boarding school survivors quiet most of their lives. But in 2013, a group of my former Ashdown House schoolmates spoke up. They went to the police about a different teacher from later in the 70s, Martin Haig, who'd taught science. I realised it was time to write an article about my own experience of abuse. It opened the floodgates. I was inundated with hundreds of emails from ex-boarders 
some of them women, but the vast majority men, detailing abuse at schools up and down the country. And they were very hard to read. There are so many stories of abuse, I started compiling a database of all the allegations. And it soon became obvious the story wasn't just about rogue paedophile teachers. Even more shocking were the schools themselves and how they failed to deal with allegations of abuse and in some cases allowed it to continue. Of course, Ashdown House featured heavily and several people had written to me about that science teacher, Martin Haig. In March last year, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison for indecent assault and gross indecency against four Ashdown pupils in the 70s. One of the men who gave evidence in court, an ex-Ashdown pupil who was a few years below me, has agreed to meet. He's asked to remain anonymous. When Mr. Haig was first sexually abusive to you, how did that play out? The first time um, I, he took me to his, his room for a slippering, um, he pulled my pants down, bent me over his bed, and then nothing happened. And he was just peering very close. I felt feel his breath on me. But it was more his dormitory activity that was really, really unsettling as well. What was that? His activity normally involved the entire dormitory, and he would, um, he would, he would get everybody to, to take their pants down and get an, ere an erection quickly. And then to test the power of the erection, he would um, he'd get us to hang things off, off the end of our, of our penises. While we were doing this, he'd be like sort of walking around, peering closely. Um, at, our, at our bits and pieces. How did you and, and, and the other, other boys from your year get round to going to the police? I think suddenly I became, and others, <clears throat> very conscious about the whole subject matter, because uh, it's obviously been in the news a lot, and it stirred up a lot of emotion. Um, and then there was a sort of coming together of um, quite a few um, old Ashtonians, and I think then there was, a, there, was a, you know, there was a big motivation at that stage to actually do something about it. Martin Haig said in court that two pupils did tell parents and they complained to the man who'd taken on some aspects of the running of the school, this man, Clive Williams. It was decided no further action would be taken, provided Haig left at the end of term. We've spoken to one of those two pupils who confirmed Martin Haig's story, that his parents did complain to Clive Williams, but added he'd also spoken to Clive Williams himself about Haig's abuse. That's what makes me really angry mm. now. I, I feel yeah. that I'm not so angry with my abuser, I'm angry mm. with the, the men in authority. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there'll be all sorts of excuses to this, you know, reputation of the school, and I think there would have been a scandal, but it seems that having a duty of care, the responsible person at that school was him. So the police have told me that, that Mr. Keane, who abused me and, and some other boys as well, is, is dead. Mm. So we won't get a chance to face him in court. I'd like to know how that feels. What's it like? For me, um, seeing him in court, it was, it was actually my first opportunity to, to confront him properly. And although I was terrified and I was very nervous, as soon as I got onto, onto the stand, emotionally it just changed right there and then. It's a shame we didn't do it 30 years ago. So, decades on, Haig finally faced justice. But because Ashton allowed him to leave quietly, he simply found another teaching job, here at the state-run Chaucer School in Canterbury. Now former Chaucer pupils are going to the police with yet more allegations of abuse by Haig. The school is now closed, but I decided to contact Chaucer's former headmaster, and he soon sent me an email. So I've been told that the Chaucer School did get a reference from Ashton House sent by the principal for Martin Haig. Blimey, that was an invitation for a school to take on board an, a, a teacher who was known, known to be a serious threat to children. I, I find it quite upsetting. I know from my own experience that Ashdown House had hushed up allegations before, because as an eight-year-old, I told my mother what my teacher, Thomas Keane, had done to me. And she took it up with Billy Williamson, the headmaster in charge while I was there. She was persuaded to take the easier course. Calm down, this is uh, nonsense. This is, doesn't happen at a lovely place like this and, and little boys make things up. 
so she let it slide. To me, it's absolutely clear that uh, th th that sort of operation conducted by the school authorities, placating the mother, uh, sweeping the um, complaint under the carpet, was going on again and again. It seems extraordinary, but clearly avoiding scandal was more important to them than keeping children safe. Simon Bailey leads Operation Hydrant, which coordinates police investigations into historical abuse. Abuse in schools is the most prolific form of institutional abuse that officers around the country are investigating. It is almost double that of any other form of institutional abuse. And of course, within a boarding school environment, children are obviously there. They're sleeping there, they're showering there once, twice a day, every day further opportunities are, are afforded. We've found shocking evidence of the scale of this abuse. We made a freedom of information request to every police force in the UK, and those that responded told us, since 2012, 425 people have been accused of carrying out sexual attacks at boarding schools. Not every force could provide further details, but at least 160 people have been charged so far. And at least 171 of the total were accused of historical abuse. Just over half the forces responded, so the total figure is likely to be far higher. So while many abusive teachers are finally facing justice, the hundreds of emails I've been sent show how rarely schools reported them to police at the time. One abuse victim shared an incredible letter that his headmaster had sent to his father about his abuser. And it goes like this. He, the teacher, has done a first-class job with the choir and has taken a tremendous interest, particularly in the younger members. Unfortunately, he has placed himself in a distinctly compromising situation. For this reason, it has been my painful duty to ask him to leave. Next term, I shall merely announce that Mr. X had to leave for personal reasons. Yours sincerely. Just astonishing. It, it was almost as though this was in the manual of how to run a private boarding school. That this is how you dealt with scandal and sexual abuses. This is the system, and it's about supporting the system, not protecting children. Just blatant, blatantly arrogant and stupid. As kids, these schools failed us in so many ways, and often we've kept their secrets. It takes the average child eight years to open up about abuse. Imagine the devastation when you've done that and you aren't believed. In 1975, age 13, Philip arrived here at Luckton School in Herefordshire, a school for children aged 5 to 18. His housemaster was this man, David Panter. Things with me started very early on in my first term. Our housemaster decided, took it upon himself to uh, inspect us in the showers. I was told to bend over and he'd stick his fingers up your bum. That was to start with, to see if it was clean. And he'd use two or three fingers. It was really very painful. Could you resist? You can't. So what you, are you going to do? He physically restrain you while he did yeah, this. Yeah, what are you going to do? But that's not where the problem is. The problem is that it starts to become normal. This is a mental rape. I think people think that paedophiles force themselves onto children. It's a lot worse than that because they get you in the brain and they make you want them to do it. And of course, then it's, oh, well, why didn't you say anything? At what point did this start progressing? I would say a few days before the end of term, the first term, uh, the first time he, he, he started masturbating at the same time, in the shower. So he'd get in the shower, and that starts to be a bit weird. So Philip worked up the courage to tell the headmaster, Keith Vivian, what had been happening. So you describe it in your own childish way. And I remember this big hand coming down of my shoulder. Now, boy, now let's stop telling stories. Run along to your class. We don't want to cause any trouble now, do we? And that's how I used to speak. And you get washed out the door. So that is actually what happened. 
Hunter continued working at the school. The following year, Philip moved into a dorm for older boys, away from Panther's clutches. But three years later, now a school prefect, Philip was told that Panther was still abusing the younger children. This little kid came out of Panther's study and he came out crying and he just said to me, Panther's fuck me. Went to see Keith Vivian, the same headmaster who had refused to believe him years before. I just said, I'm not packing down this time. If you don't do something about it, I'm going to tell everybody. And it was quite interesting because nothing happened for quite a while in this last year. And this carried on. And I went back again with the other um, house prefect. And he got angry with me. Vivian? Yeah, got very angry with me. He told me to go away and stop causing trouble. But the headmaster finally listened. By the next day, Panta was gone. His wife and him just disappeared quietly away. No news, no story, no police, no nothing. And that, effectively, is my story at Luxton School. In 2016, Panta was jailed for nine years for indecent assault and gross indecency against seven Luxton pupils. To avoid a contested trial, he was only convicted for the crimes he admitted. He pleaded not guilty to the allegations made by Philip, which he still denies, as well as the allegations Philip says were made to him by the younger boy. So Panther being jailed is not actually the end of the story. I've heard from Philip and others that the headmaster knew exactly what was going on. When does he answer for this grotesque failure to not react to, and to fail utterly to look after the safety of the children in his care? Lupton School told us our sympathies are with any survivors of non-recent abuse. However, allegations from that period cannot be answered because the school closed in 1985 and a new school was later opened under a trust which was established as a new charity, a separate legal entity. The headmaster, Keith Vivian, went on to become a vicar. He told us he has no recollection of any complaint made by Philip but does remember when prefects came to him and says he asked Panta to leave the school premises immediately and informed the school's governing body. At no time would he not have acted immediately on such accusations, but it was not a police matter at that time. Hearing these stories makes me think of my time at Ashdown House and what became of my abuser, Thomas Keane. He died in 2005. I managed to track down a copy of his death certificate. It said he was a retired teacher. I'm worried he could have gone on abusing children for decades. I do feel a responsibility. We could easily have stopped him. So we collectively put another generation of children at risk from this violent, evil man. I feel guilty about that. Of the hundreds of abuse stories that are in my database, some stand out because they echo my own experience. I've heard from a number of men complaining about a teacher called George Pilgrim who taught here at St. Aubyn's School in East Sussex in the 1970s. So the accounts are pretty much the same. And Mr. Pilgrim was one of those teachers who liked to shove his hands into boys' shorts and grope them. And it left some of them really very troubled. It's pretty much what happened to me at my school as well. I'm on my way to meet Richard, who was abused by Pilgrim a number of times. Richard has said that he doesn't want to discuss the, the details of what Pilgrim did to him on camera. And I completely empathize with that. I mean, the, it's, these are very private matters. And, and the fact that they still hurt and corrode um, all these years on is a sign of the depth of the impact. Pilgrim seemingly had no fear of getting caught. One day he was abusing 10-year-old Richard in the classroom when the headmaster, William Jervis, walked in. The headmaster was furious, absolutely furious. I've never seen him like that. I mean, he was a strict, severe <laughs> headmaster, but I was surprised. Um, 
and Pilgrim turned into a little boy himself and he kind of walked off to his desk and cowered and made various excuses. Uh, but it wasn't good enough. The incident was never mentioned to Richard again. There was nothing asked. There was no sort of attempt to find out mm. if anything else had happened to me or anyone else. The school had such a, a lax, feeble way of dealing with it. And the feelings of the children were not of any import? Well, apparently not, because there was nothing. What was its long-term effect? Well, I wouldn't you? recommend it as a way of developing good self-esteem. But I've had people say to me, oh, come on, a little bit of fumbling around, not so serious, you can't blame your problems on that. Well, that's poisonous claptrap. Mm. But um, it's like having a, a, a toxin inside you, isn't it? Mm. It's bound to have an effect. But as I've found before, Pilgrim simply moved on from St Albans to another private prep school. We found that school and it confirmed he'd arrived, complete with a reference from St Albans. Hi there, it's Alex Renton here. I, I was very keen to, to talk to you about, about this character Pilgrim. The headmaster from the school Pilgrim went on to teach at agreed to talk with me as long as he remained anonymous. So that's extraordinary. That's confirmation from the headmaster of the school that Pilgrim went to after St Albans, that he'd arrived there, and within two months they had to get rid of him. He was abusing the children in the classroom. Pilgrim is dead now and never faced police charges. It's the same pattern I'm seeing time and time again. Schools getting rid of the teacher, doing nothing to stop them abusing somewhere else. But for the children, entire lives can be contaminated. Decades on, we found more evidence of abuse at St Albans. Same school, different teacher. I've been contacted by the sister of another more recent St Albans student. His story shows the damage that can be done. Gavin Purchase arrived there in 1987, aged eight. He took his own life a couple of years ago, at 37 years old. His sister Rachel has kept the suicide note he left behind. Dear Mum, you are probably the reason I have lasted so long and achieved so much, but I am living a nightmare. Six breakdowns before the age A popular, successful man, his letter blamed the decision to end his life on sexual abuse he said he'd been subjected to at school. We will always be with you. Love your boy, Gavin. 